So I wanted to give a little bit of a demonstration of the kinds of things that we can do in Access with Forms. Uh, to do this, I just wanted to use the uh, department table and the employee table that we've been working with. Okay, pretty simple system of tables. And I'm just going to review some concepts similar to the ones that we've uh, gone through in class. You'll notice for convenience, I expanded the employee table. It's really just a convenience so that I can show you uh, more features a little more quickly. So let's sort of do a little bit of review. I'm going to close the relationships. Yeah, sure, we can see that. Let's take a look at the department table because even with a small table, we can actually do uh, quite a lot to help protect our data. Okay, so if you um, remember, we said that the kinds of things that we might want to do uh, to make sure that we can render these forms and reports properly, we probably want to put in captions, right? So I probably would want to put in something like department ID for a uh, department ID and just give it a name that will really help a user to understand the real context of this field. Also keep in mind that when you type in the caption, this will give a uniform look to that field in all of the forms and reports that you create. So it makes it a little easier to standardize the presentation of fields. You don't have to worry about typing, sort of say, department ID in one place and department identifier in another. The caption, if the caption is pulled for all forms and reports, you can be ensure you can you can be sure that basically all of your reports and forms will consistently refer to that field the same way. That's quite an advantage, right? So we'll do the same thing for department name. Okay. Give it a nice field name. And from here, we'll probably want to sort of take a little a look at some of the other things that we can do. And one of the things that we mentioned that we might want to do in order to protect our data in a form is to establish a validation rule. So if we look at the field size for department name, we see that we have allowed 20 characters, a reasonable size. Uh, what One of the things that we may want to do in terms of validating this data is provide a minimum, right? So I may not want a user to be able to type something like, you know, a two-word department name, right? We may want them, we might want to force them to be a little bit more descriptive. So one of the things that I could do is actually use the length function in Access to ensure that the field is longer than, say, three characters or five characters. Okay, and so I'll do something like this, department name, right? So I'm going to say the length of department name must be greater than, let's call it five. Right, so basically what I'm saying is you can't have a department name that's you know, less than six characters. Right? If you do that, um, it won't let you put that data in there. So in order to make this validation rule meaningful, we'll also have to give it sort of a text. So if someone types a department name that's only you know, three characters long, what are we going to display to them so that they understand what rule they violated? Well, we would probably, this is where we use validation text. And we would probably want to put something like the department name must be at least six characters. Uh, something like this. Okay, so we want to give some clear indication of what validation rule what validation rule has not been met so that the person knows exactly how to fix what they've typed in. Uh, so let's just sort of test this, right? We're going to save it. Uh, it will give us this update saying that the data integrity rules have been changed and that you know we're responsible for making sure that existing data uh, validates, right? So it's going to ask us, do we want to validate this? Okay, and we can say yes, right? And uh, we can look just from briefly looking at the table that, uh, you know, all of our data currently meets that standard, right? So the first thing we want to do is probably test this, right? So, uh, you know, I might type something like R and D, okay? Notice if I try to type something that's R and D, it says department name must be at least six characters. That's exactly what I wanted to happen, okay? So now I might type something like research, okay? Uh, so we did an okay job with making sure that we've got a minimum length requirement. Okay, so our validation worked, but notice I've got a new problem here. 
Uh, I don't know anybody who would want uh, someone to type two different department names with two different department IDs. I don't really see uh, a need for that. And we could say that, well, that's actually something that we don't want. We want to make sure that we can restrict that. This is the kind of thing that you would use an index for. Okay, so I'm going to delete this record. And we're going to adjust the table to make sure that we can't do this. Right, the easy way to do this is to actually impose an index. Okay, and what we are going to say is we want this field to be indexed and we want no duplicates. Right, I do not want someone to be able to type in the same department name twice. Okay, that's at best ambiguous, at worst, it introduces all kinds of errors that you can have in your data. Um, and so, I, you know, just for the sort of scale and scope of this database, this is not something that we want. So we want to be able to uh, protect against it. The index and in access is the way to do this. Uh, you'll remember from our discussion of SQL that uh, this would be the equivalent, roughly, of a um, unique constraint. Okay, so basically what we're doing is enforcing a unique constraint against department name. Right, so we're going to save that table change. And of course, we want to go back and we want to test it. And so we go here. I go and I say, well, okay, I'm going to meet the long, the length requirement, but I'm going to try to duplicate the name. Notice it won't let me. The changes you requested to the table were not successful because they would create duplicate values in the index, and so on and so forth. We do not want that. So we're going to have to make some sort of adjustment. Right? Um, obviously, that's just sort of a test thing. So I'll remove it. Okay, but you know, right off the bat, even with a small sort of type table like this department table, we have options to protect the data. Okay, we can always create validation rules. Uh, we can use our validation text to give a meaningful response to users. And we can use indexes to enforce what's the equivalent roughly of a unique constraint. So even with a small table like this, we have some options for making sure that our data is protected. So if we, uh, if with even just the simple table, uh, we can do some things that will help improve the quality of our data, let's see what this might look like from the point of view of a more complicated table or a table with more fields, something like TBL employee. Okay. Um, you know, obviously we've got lots of different types here. We've got lots of things that we can do. Um, we'll probably want to make sure that we use our captions, right? So this is something that will come in handy and I'll just start typing these in. Uh, you'll also notice that um, when you start dealing with numeric values and other kinds of things, all of a sudden you have other kinds of considerations that you might want to think about. So uh, with respect to birth date, we may decide that we don't want to allow birth dates in the future, right? So uh, when we start thinking about validations, we can start to build that into our system, right? So we may say that, uh, right, so we may say something like, um, yeah, nobody should really have a birth date that's in the future. So if we wanted to enforce that, right, we can say the validation rule, we can say, well, birth date really can't be greater than in access the function would be now. Okay, you could also probably use date. But for our purposes, we'll use now. Right? And all we can say is, you know, something pretty straightforward, like, um, you know, for our validation text, we would say, you know, the birth date must be in the past, okay? Um, or we might say something like, you know, the birth, the birth date cannot be in the future, right? You wanna give some indication that the birth date can't be in the future, okay? And we'll also wanna check things like, we'll wanna make sure if the birth date is required that we specify that, okay? But um, with dates, all of a sudden we get some new, some new kinds of options. Okay, and um, you know, we may have to make some changes. So for example, with um, default values, right, if I'm going to um, specify some validation rules, I also may want to specify some default values, right? So, you know, I may not have collected everyone's birthday, for example, so I may want to say, well, I better put in something that we can use as sort of a default value, so we could do something like that, right? 
and uh, access will be pretty forgiving uh, to us about that. And so we could sort of put that in as a validation rule. Salary, right? Um, salary is another one where some of these rules could actually be quite helpful. So for example, um, we might want to make sure that the that the salary isn't less than zero, right? So salary must be greater than zero. This makes perfect sense. You really can't have a negative salary. If someone did something like that, uh, it would be a mistake. So we would want to check that, right? And then we would write a message that's you know meaningful, right? So salary must be greater than zero. Okay, and give the user some sense of. Uh, what went wrong if something in fact did go wrong. Right? So that would be another thing that we could do. Um, you know, vacation days, again, we could do things. I've already specified a default value there. Um, this might be a place where we may say that you can't have negative vacation days, or, or maybe people can in this case. I mean, maybe in some sense uh, people can borrow against future dates, right? So we don't, we don't really know. Um, higher date gives us something else to think about here. Let me sort of put in my captions. Higher date gives us something else to think about. Because we can probably think of a reasonable validation rule, but the validation rule depends on comparing higher date to birth date, right? So in other words, we know that you, sh you can't be hired before you were born. Um, but the place to do this, because what we really want to do here is compare the values in two fields, what we actually want to do is take a look at the property sheet for the entire table, right? So what we really want to do is we really want to say, create a table constraint, right? So this is the equivalent of a check constraint. And what we're doing is we're making sure that the higher date is greater than the birth date, okay? And we've also given a validation text here that says as much, right? and I'll just sort of pull it over so we can take a look at it, right? The higher date must be later than the birth date. Okay, so we want to make sure that we don't let users do something incorrect uh, just because they've made a mistake, right? So these are a couple of other things that we can do. Not only can we check values of a particular column against some absolute, right? Either the current date or um, you know something like zero. We can also compare the values in different fields and make sure that they conform to some of our business rules or just basic logic about the way the world works. So those are a couple other things that we can do um, with the tool. Uh, let's see, so I just want to sort of keep uh, up with all of my captioning here, right? I would sort of want higher date, right? And, you know, phone number. Uh, you know, so phone number, um, we have some sort of new tools for phone number, right? We might want to say that this is required, okay? And if we make it required, we may need to put in a default value, right? So I might just put in like an impossible number here, right, as a default value. Um, and phone number gives us sort of whole new options for things that we can do, right? Because we can say, we can use an input mask. Right. Uh, sure, I'll save it. Right. That's okay. No worries. All right. So for an input mask, remember what an input mask will do is basically prompt the user for uh, the types of input that it expects. Okay. It helps us create sort of the context for what the user is entering in. So Access gives us a few input mask uh, items that we can look through. Obviously, in this case, we would want to pick the one related to phone number. Uh, keep in mind that nines mean that the number is optional, zeros means that it's required. So in my sort of little world, let's say I decide that, you know what, I want to make sure that all of these are in fact zero. So I'm going to say there should be three zeros there. Okay, and I also want to make sure that I get the mask right. Okay, so it should look like that. Right? All of them should be required. I don't mind leaving that as the placeholder. That seems fine to me. Uh, I'm going to test it out right? and try it. You can always just sort of test it out and say, you know, 999, 999, 9999. Yep, that looks pretty good. Okay, uh, here it's going to ask you, well, do you actually want to store the symbols? Or do you want to store the data without the symbols? Um, this is really up to you. It's really a trade-off between efficiency and preserving the context. 
Uh, for this example, we'll just sort of put in the extra symbols. But um, if you were working in an environment where uh, sort of the efficient storage, meaning you needed to save space, really mattered, if that was what you cared about, you might pick the second option. Um, but for us, this is just sort of fine. And then that'll do it. Okay, and notice it's going to put in the mask for you. And uh, so that's another tool that we can use. Okay, not only will it help us keep the data consistent in terms of structure, it even gives some help to the users to understand what to do there. Okay, so I've got a few other places here where we might sort of enforce some things, right? Um, I could put captions here, but it'll take the default. So um, unless you know, if it's just one word and address is suitable, um, you know, you, you could pretty much leave that alone, right? So I'll take phone number here. Um, I'm going to leave address. I'm going to leave city. I'm going to leave state. Um, for state, I will do one thing. Um, I want to add a validation rule here that also is about length. Okay, so I want to make sure that people put in the state code, right? So I'm going to make sure that every state has two letters, not one, not zero, but two. So what we're going to say is the length of state, okay, should equal two, right? And uh, we'll want to s give a good message here. So uh, the state must have two characters, okay? And give some message that people can understand, right? We'll make it required. We might want to make a default value there for so you know. PA, sort of save it in PA. It'll ta tell us about integrity rules, okay? Um, and we may want to do similar things here, right? So we may decide to make um, city required as well, right? We may want to make address required. And these are all, you know, this is all sort of uh, stuff that you would want to do to make sure that your database conforms to uh, the data requirements set by the problem they're trying to solve. Right, and we're going to do the same for zip code. Zip code's another example of a place where you can actually use an input mask again. So, you know, let's take a look at that, see what that looks like. Yeah, it's all okay. I know I've changed the data requirements. I'll fix it. No worries. Okay, so when we say zip code here, right, um, I'd probably want to leave the mask the way it is. Uh, not everybody would know their uh, zip plus four format. So I like the idea that the first five are required and the last four are optional. Okay, um, I'm going to start with the symbols, okay, just for fun. And there we go. Um, and then department ID, you know, I'll put in a value here, a caption for a value here. We'll just call it department. Okay, and um, that pretty much will get us where we want to go. Let's take a look. Let's test some of these things and see how they actually work in practice. Okay, so, um, you know, so I'll probably want to fill in some new phone numbers. Okay, notice uh, our all of our stuff works properly, and I'm just going to sort of run through and add a bunch of numbers here. Okay, we've got stuff for addresses. Oh, I made a mistake, okay? The field is too small to accept the amount of data you're trying to insert, all right? Well, so what that means is I've got to go back and give a little bit more space. Ooh, and it violates that. So we're going to have to sort of go and change this. And this is part of what you would do. I mean, you have to make changes to the system, and sometimes it's not going to let you. It's not going to let me save the record. That's actually what I want. That's okay. Right? And what it means is that in order for me to implement that mask, I've got to make sure I've got enough space. Okay, So what went wrong is even though 12 is a reasonable size, um, I forgot about some of the places that um, it adds extra characters, right? So I've got 10 characters for the uh, numbers, but I, for I think I'm one short. So let's try it again. Let's put in 13 and let's see what we got. Okay, we've got to make sure we get all this stuff right. In the database. Okay, and let's try to add a phone number again. And so 111, 222. One, two, three, four. Okay, and let's see if it likes that better. It does. Okay, so 13 works. Um, and then, you know, I'm just going to sort of type address, right? West Street. Okay. City, Washington. Okay, PA. 
Okay, the zip code, uh, let's see. All right, notice we still get our, our nice uh, sort of input mask there. And department ID is already filled in. All right, so we have you know, more or less done the things that we wanted to do. We're gonna wanna test a few things though, right? Um, and we'll do that with sort of our new, we'll enter a few new records and make sure that it does what we want, us to, want it to do. So, um, okay, I'll enter um, Sue Blue. Okay, notice we get a default birth date. Okay, so we don't have to worry about getting default birth dates. I'm just gonna sort of send this back a little bit in time. Right. So we'll make this 1990, let's say. Put in a salary. And it's very much in the past. Ooh, what did I do? Okay, um, it's given me a hard time about putting in this date, which means I've done something very, very wrong. So let's go find out what that is. Okay, we're going to want to check this out. I don't care if I can save the record because I messed it up anyway. So if we come back and we take a look at the birth date, let's see what I did. Okay, I got the direction wrong, right? I said that it has to be greater than now. What I really wanted it to do was to say it's gotta be less than now, okay? The birth date has to be in the past, All right? So this is something that's really easy to do. You're moving quickly, you, uh, you know, not thinking about the direction that this has to go, and so you can get it wrong. This is why we have to test things, right? It's a typical thing to do. It's really easy to do, especially if you're moving quickly, right? This is why we test it. So let's try to do it again, all right? It's Sue Blue. Okay, I'm gonna move my year back a little bit. Sort of, may, I'm going to make up some dates, right? And uh, I think what we'll want to do is we'll want to test um, the higher date piece, right? So we want to make sure that um, we can't put in a higher date before the birth date, right? That in theory should be impossible. So let's try to put in 1980, okay? Oh, something went wrong, right? I, I have created a context where the higher date can actually be before the birth date. No good. Let's go find out what went wrong. Okay, and it's giving me a whole con all kinds of problems because I haven't put in everything. So we're going to go fix what's wrong and then come back to it. Okay, so we'll want to look at the property sheet, right? And I said the higher date must be greater than the birth date, okay? Um, that actually sort of feels right to me. So let's go take a look and see what went wrong. Date, birth date. Right, so if I go back and I try to make an adjustment here, right, if I say the higher date was actually 1930 here, right, oh, it must be later. Okay, so it looks like it is working. Right? So this is the kind of stuff you have to do. You have to make sure that everything is working correctly. So let's keep going. Right, make sure that everything is the way we expect it to be. Okay, so Sue Blue, okay, 2000. And let me try to get uh, Sue Blue hired in 1990. Okay, it's telling us we've got some other required fields. So I'm going to just sort of blow through these quickly. All right, put in a zip code because I made all of these required. And department ID, I'm gonna put in one for now. Okay, all right, and it tells me that the higher date must be later than the birth date. All right, so let's go explore. So it is catching that, okay? It's catching it a little bit later than we might think because it is checking it as a table constraint, all right? So we're gonna sort of just show what the effect is of these different kinds of constraints, right? Remember, because it's a table constraint, right? It may actually give you that message at a different time, right? At first we thought, oh, it's going to do what we want it to do. Not so, it checks these things at different times. So if I make this, sort of 2011, okay, and then I actually click off the record, 
then it works. Okay, let's sort of review that one more time. Right? If I try to make this 1990, okay, it's not going to tell me when I click here. All right, it would do if it was a field constraint. Okay, but because it's actually a table constraint, it's going to wait to tell me when I actually click off the record. All right, this is the kind of thing that's just easier to sort of see what happens than it is to describe it. Okay, so the rule was correct, right? What was wrong was the expectation of when the rule would be enforced. So now I can go back, right, make sure that this uh, is meets the requirements of the data. Okay, and we're all good. Uh, one last thing I wanted to check. Okay, let's see if we can make a birth date in the future, right? So let's say uh, we're into science fiction and we want somebody to be able to be, you know, born in 2112. Okay, note this still works. The birth date must be in the past, right? So it's not going to let me do that. And if I try to click off of it, even if I click in the same record, right? Remember, this is a field constraint. So it's going to check that for us and we can correct her birth date. We'll make it 1980 this time. Okay, and we've met all of the requirements for the data. All right, so um, we've actually been talking a lot about all of the stuff underneath, right? And um, I do this because um, all of these things will actually affect the way the form works. So, you know, good form design and good record design, good report design, actually starts with making sure that you get your metadata correct. Okay, and it's a lot of work. Like there are a lot of rules. You have to really think carefully about it. It's easy to make mistakes. You have to sort out table constraints from record from um, field constraints. You have to you separate you know all the different rules. You have to sort of integrate all the techniques. But these are you know some of the techniques, some of the things that go into using them. And in the next video, we'll actually talk about how all of these things can contribute to making a more usable form.